as a mother, um, and I, I simply cannot imagine um, being a mother in Gaza right now or being a, a parent. Um, and, you know, thinking about my daughter was a big part of why I resigned. Um, because I knew at, at some point in the future she would hear about this. And I, when she asked me if she said, Mom, you, you were working for the State Department. Like, what were you doing? I, I wanted to be able to tell her. Oh, sorry. My name is Anel Sheline. I worked for the State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor's Office of Near East Affairs. I started um, March 27th of 2023, and I resigned on March 26th, 2024, due to the Biden administration's unconditional support for Israel's military operations and blockade of Gaza. There are many ways that the U.S. record on human rights was significantly tarnished before October 7th, but after October 7th, the U.S. had zero credibility. Many people are attracted to government work because they want to have an impact, and so when I said I was going to resign, um, colleagues said, well, you think you're going to have a bigger impact outside of government than you do inside? Which, you know, is a fair point. And I, I do think that as someone who has spent most of my career outside of government, I, I did want to try to do what I could on the inside. I think what became clear over the course of my time inside government, especially the essentially six months from October 7th to when I resigned, it just became clear that there was nothing someone on the inside could really do. I have a PhD in political science. I studied the Middle East. And I, just when I was starting the, the PhD, I applied for a Boren Fellowship, which uh, took me to Egypt for about a year studying Arabic. And that meant that I owed the government a year. I was already fairly skeptical of the US government, so I didn't have a lot of illusions about what it would be like to work for the US government, but I did think it would be worthwhile to see kind of, you know, I critique US government policy, so it would be useful to go in and see how do these decisions actually get made. So when October 7th happened, it was obviously a shock. However, it became clear very early on what Israel's intentions were. And this was something the State Department was tracking. And this is part of why we saw Josh Paul resign so early, for example, because he was involved in authorizing the weapons and he was seeing the way this was going. When it came to providing lethal equipment, lethal arms to Israel, uh, I, I could not support the provision of those arms into a situation where it was clear, uh, and as we have now seen, uh, that they were going to be used to kill so many civilians. Inside the State Department, to me it be, and, and to many of my colleagues, it became clear very early on what the U.S. was going to do as far as this kind of unconditional support and what Israel was going to do as far as really just essentially trying to destroy Gaza. That, that became clear extremely early on. Can you tell Americans who turn on their televisions or open up their social media or, or read a newspaper and they see these horrific images out of Gaza, the destruction, now the weather and the rain, the number of bodies, the mothers screaming for their children, just the horrible death toll and devastation that Gazans are currently living in. And they wonder to themselves, is the United States supporting this sort of pain and suffering? I felt 
complicit to the extent that by not speaking out about it, that I was participating, you know, even though, you know, I, Israel, Palestine was not one of the countries in my portfolio, but I was covering countries where I was observing directly the impact this conflict was having. And like I said, that the impossibility of trying to advocate for human rights. I wasn't initially planning to go public. I planned to just resign and I'd let my supervisors know I was resigning over Gaza. And so I didn't think anybody would care that, you know, this very junior person who'd been there a year decided to, to speak out against it. But it was in conversations with colleagues who themselves were horrified by what was happening, but who were not in a position to resign or who did feel that by staying on the inside, they, they were able to have an impact. And they said, please go public with your resignation. I'd done what I could on the inside. I just couldn't walk through the door anymore. You know, and I, I owed the government a year and I didn't stay a day longer. State Department staffer Anel Sheline resigned in protest this week and decided to go public after colleagues convinced her to speak out on their behalf. In an interview with The Washington Post, Sheline said that she wasn't able to do her job anymore and that, quote, trying to advocate for human rights just became impossible. The way Israel and as well as the United States have been involved in conducting this war, it could have been done in a very different manner. The, the levels of the, the casualties that we're seeing, the use of starvation as a weapon of war, the fact that the United States isn't using its leverage to insist that aid get in and that a ceasefire be, be put in place. I thought to a certain extent, Blinken was, was responsible. I thought maybe Jake Sullivan, but I think and part of that was due to the fact that I, I sort of thought that Biden had so many things on his plate, you know, that he'd maybe just outsourced his Middle East policy to his sort of direct team. Um, because he had done a good job of portraying himself as a fairly empathetic person. I, in my head, I sort of thought if Joe Biden were really paying attention You know, this this wouldn't be happening. Um, excuse me. But I think, unfortunately, what we've seen, I think it's fairly clear that the Gaza policy was coming from him. For all that I am extremely critical of U.S. foreign policy, I very much believe in what America is supposed to stand for, and I want to live in a country that lives up to that. I think that the way the United States uses human rights, which is what I observed inside the State Department, the, the U.S. uses it selectively. We criticize our adversaries. We criticize Syria. We criticize Iran. We criticize China. We don't criticize Israel. We don't criticize Saudi Arabia. These violations are documented, but it doesn't lead to any sort of change in policy. U.S. military power remains the primary objective, you know, maintaining the U.S. as the military hegemon on the global stage is the, the primary thing driving U.S. foreign policy. We are undermining the idea of human rights writ large and, and delegitimizing it as a concept, which is extremely alarming. I'm shocked by the lack of action of the international community. I'm shocked by the hands raised by the U.S. ambassador in the Security Council voting against a ceasefire, vetoing a ceasefire. I'm shocked by the lack of action of principled states who need to take, a, again, a principled, concrete stand against this aberration. I don't know that there's anything the U.S. government could do at this point, maybe short of actually working to establish a state of Palestine, that would address that, that complete destruction of American credibility on these issues. I think unless we saw a complete 180 in policy where we suddenly saw this administration withholding weapons, flooding Palestine with aid, and, and working to establish a Palestinian state. I think that short of that, there's very little that the U.S. could do. Any senior person who says, I just wasn't aware, is lying. I do think 
that, at least in terms of U.S. support for Israel, I do think that a generational change is coming. But in terms of kind of the, the broader trajectory of U.S. foreign policy, I'm, I'm worried for the future of, of, of this country and what effects that is likely to have on the rest of the world.